Hello Chem 101 students and welcome to our second and final lecture of this shortened week, uh, the holiday week this week. It's going to be about electronic structure and periodic trends. So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the structure of the atom in terms of what the electrons are doing. Uh, the electrons are occupying regions called energy levels, also known as shells, and also regions called orbitals or subshells. Uh, we'll also talk about some periodic trends near the end, including the atomic radius, the size of atoms, and also the ionization energy, or the energy required to completely remove an electron from an atom. So one way of describing uh, atoms is with Bohr diagrams. Now Bohr diagrams aren't the most accurate of, of uh of ways of describing atoms, but they are uh, pretty useful in terms of describing the energy levels in the atoms. They don't do a good job of describing the orbitals or the way in which the electrons really move because electrons don't really move like orbits around the nucleus like this. Uh, so here's an example with lithium-7. So for lithium-7, we're going to want to do is you're going to want to check your periodic table. I'm going to open up a periodic the the class periodic table so I can s quickly switch between them. Uh, so here, if we're looking at the periodic table, we have lithium. It's right here. It's element three, and so its atomic number will be three. Atomic number three. That means it has three protons, it has three electrons, and in terms of neutrons, its neutrons will be the mass number, which is seven, minus the atomic number, which is three. So it has four neutrons. And so that's how we figured out in the nucleus here, we've drawn in the middle three protons and four neutrons. Now when it comes to electrons, so the electrons are going to be occupying what are known as energy levels as they travel around the nucleus. And this is an element of quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum, quantum mechanics is basically describing that these electrons have to occupy particular energy levels. They cannot be in these orbits that are in between here. These electrons, these two electrons, they are in the first energy level or in the second energy level. They're never anywhere in between which is a very weird idea, right? Uh, when we think of, you know, me walking over to my couch, well, I'm gonna, you know, travel along the path and between, be, you know, somewhere between my couch along the way. Electrons, they don't do that. They jump from one energy level to the other and they're never anywhere in between, which is very, very strange way of moving around. And, but that's, that's a, the quantum mechanics and that description it works very well to describe uh, the way electrons in atoms behave, even though it feels and sounds very strange. So uh, we see that lithium has three electrons, and it turns out that the first energy level in all atoms can only fit two electrons. So the first two electrons have gotten in the first energy level or shell. There's one more electron to go in lithium, so that third electron has to go in the second energy level or the second shell. And that completes our Bohr diagram for lithium. On the homework, I have you draw one Bohr diagram. Uh, now, what if we have more electrons? Uh, so we saw that it took two electrons to fill the first shell, the first energy level. So how many electrons would it take to fill the, the second shell? Uh, so we're going to see that in the next example, just a, a bit more terminology. I almost skipped that. Uh, the outer shell here in any atom where the last electrons are, um, this is referred to as the valence shell, the valence shell. And uh, any electrons in the valence shell are called valence electrons. Uh, and the valence electrons are going to be very important because the number of valence electrons is actually going to have a huge impact on the, the chemical properties of these elements. And so something that we're going to be very, very concerned with as we uh, 
pass the first exam and, and start covering new material is the number of valence electrons in atoms. This is going to become super important to us. So lithium, as we saw, it had one valence electron, and that valence electron is in the second shell. Okay. Now I want you to pick something out on the periodic table here. Check it out. Lithium has one valence electron, and it's in the second shell. Lithium is in the first group. I'm going to call this right here group 1. 1A, I'm going to go by the numbers that are A here. Call this group 1A, I'm going to call this group 1. It's it, lithium is in the very first group. It also has one valence electron. Interesting. Group one, one valence electron. Hmm. Also, lithium is in the second period, row two, the second row. And its one valence electron is in the second shell. Oops. Coincidence? Hmm. Let's see. Let's look at another example. This is sodium 23. So let's go through how we would draw this Bohr diagram for sodium 23. We look at the periodic table again. Sodium is element 11 right here. So we can write its atomic number. I'll write it down here in the lower left, which is where people write the atomic number when they do write it. So what this means is that sodium has 11 electrons, or 11 protons. It also has 11 electrons, because it's a neutral sodium atom. And its number of neutrons is going to be the mass number, 23, minus the atomic number, 11. So its number of neutrons is 12, so it has 12 neutrons. So in the nucleus here, I've put the protons and the neutrons. 11 protons, 12 neutrons. Now I have to put the 11 electrons in shells. It turns out from quantum mechanics we have found that two electrons fit in the first shell for all atoms. We saw that in lithium. And only eight can fit in the second shell. So now we have put two electrons in the first shell, eight electrons in the second shell. That's 10 electrons. But sodium has one more. That one extra electron is going to go into the third shell here. So sodium has one electron in its third shell right here. This is the one electron in its third shell. It has one valence electron. So sodium has one valence electron in its third shell. Sodium is in group one. Coincidence? That was the same for lithium, right? Lithium had one valence electron, but it was in the second shell. Sodium also has one valence electron, and it's also in group one. Interesting. Also, that valence electron, the one valence electron, is in the third shell. And sodium is in the third row, or the third period. Oh my gosh, so this funny arrangement here of the periodic table is starting to make a little sense. It's all based on the electrons and where they are in the atom. That is why the periodic table has this funny shape with this cutout and everything. It has to do with the groups telling you how many valence electrons and the rows telling you what shell those valence electrons are in. So the shell, what is this shell? It's a region of space around the nucleus that contains electrons that have about the same energy. Now when you think of energy, going back to the Bohr diagram here, uh, you can think of these like kind of like planets, even though they don't really behave that way. And you can think about like maybe this is the planet Earth, and this is like a satellite going around the planet Earth, right? If the satellite is very close, the Earth pulls on it very strongly. Uh, and it's, it's, and it's lower in energy. These all want to, would want to fall down if they were orbiting the Earth, right? They would be attracted to the Earth. Uh, so we say that the ones that are lower have lower potential energy because they have less, less distance to fall. 
So the lower, the lower orbitals are closer to the middle, they have lower energy. The higher orbitals are farther from the middle, farther from the, the nucleus which they are attracted to and are higher in energy. Just like if you have a ball at the top of my desk here, a bowling ball, it has higher energy than if it were on the floor because it can fall down and release that energy. And so that's the same thing here. The big difference is that electrons don't fall into the nucleus, which is the weird thing about uh, quantum mechanics. Instead, they stay in their orbitals. But the farther the energy, the farther away from the nucleus it is, the higher the energy in the orbital. So these, uh, these, these shells or energy levels are region of space that the electrons occupy that have about the same energy and spend their time around the same distance from the nucleus. Now besides shells or energy levels, we also have orbitals or subshells as they're also called. And these orbitals come in several types. They're defined basically by their shape. Uh, S orbitals, which are were represented here, S orbitals have a spherical type shape. Uh, these in this row are P orbitals. They have a P here. Uh, and these have a dumbbell type shape with two lobes here. One here, one here, one here, one here. And there are three P orbitals that come in a set, as we'll see. Uh, and these X, Y, and Z here are indicating their the orientation. So these ones are kind of popping out of the page here. These ones are going in the other direction. These ones are straight up and down. And finally, there are d orbitals. We're not going to say a whole lot about d orbitals, but they have very funny shapes to them. We're going to mo mainly focus in this class on the, the s and p orbitals. So in this class, I'm going to focus you on the s and p orbitals. I'm not going to do the d orbitals very much. Uh, your book does talk about d orbitals a little bit, but I'm going to focus on s and p orbitals. So um, we said that higher energy levels mean high, uh, further away from the nucleus, higher in potential energy. There are also energies associated with which type of orbital the electrons go into. Uh, so in order to describe the relative energies of these orbitals, we're going to use electron energy diagrams. Uh, orbitals that are closer to the nucleus will be lower in energy, and electrons will go there first. Those are the more favorable ones. Just like if you had a, if I'm if I'm holding my calculator, if I don't hold this, the calculator is going to drop to a lower energy state on the ground. Same thing, orbitals will drop to a lower energy state. In fact, they call the lower energy state the ground state. Drops to the lowest energy state, just like my calculator would drop if I let it go. So the lowest energy orbitals will fill with electrons first, and then, then the remaining electrons will go in higher and higher energy orbitals. A, uh, and a shell or an energy level contains orbitals that are all approximately the same distance from a nucleus. So a, sh a shell or an energy level can have multiple orbitals in it, but all those orbitals will be approximately the same distance from the nucleus. So this is the general electron energy diagram. It does go higher than this to d orbitals and so forth, but in this class I'm just going to cover up to from the, the this low energy orbital called the 1s up to this higher energy orbital called the 3p. And so this diagram represents the relative energies of a variety of orbitals. So you'll see that the lowest energy orbital is a 1s orbital. And then higher energy than that, so what this means 1s by the way is it's an s type spherical orbital as we saw in the picture and it's a part of the first energy level. Then higher energy than that is an s orbital that is a part of the second energy level or the second shell. Then higher energy than that are the p orbitals that are in the second shell, the second energy level. And there are three of them and they all have the same energy. So they're represented by these three lines here. And they're all put right next to each other because that means they're all the same energy. Then higher energy than that is the s orbital that's in the third shell. And then even higher energy than that are the p orbitals, three of them, 
that are in the third energy level. Now you could memorize this energy diagram, but I'm going to show you why you don't. This, this pattern here is actually built into the periodic table and you will always have a periodic table. So you can use that to, to translate this. But let's use this for a moment without the periodic table and fill this up with electrons uh, for a variety of atoms. We'll start with lithium. So as we saw before, uh, looking at lithium again, lithium is element three, it has three valence electrons. So the way in which we fill this up is we put the first electron at the lowest energy level and we give it an upward arrow. We're gonna see why we give these arrows. Then the second electron will go in the same orbital. One orbital can fit two electrons in it. After that, it's full. So we're gonna fill those orbitals from the lowest to the highest. After the first 1s orbital is full, the third electron will go in the 2s orbital. And that's all three of the lithium electrons. So the, the, valence, the valence electron here, this is the valence electron for lithium. It's in the second energy level and there's one of them. It's this one right here. So rule two is that if two electrons are sharing the same orbital, they share with an opposite property called spin. Now, spin is basically a quantum mechanical property that doesn't have a very obvious uh, macroscopic analog. It's hard to describe what it is. It's essentially a mathematical property that describes the way that electrons behave very well. You could kind of think of it as, you know, one of them, one electron spinning one way and one the other, which is where the name comes from, but really it's, it's not related to the spinning of the electron as we think of spinning. Uh, for, for like a ball or something. Uh, but we represent these opposite spins as an up arrow and a down arrow. So in, one, in an energy diagram like this, if two electrons sh share the same orbital, they have to have opposing spins. This is referred to as the Pauli exclusion principle in your book. You don't have to memorize that, but that's just what it's called. Uh, so what about a different element? What about... So as you saw here, so let's, let's uh, review the rules we just did. We fill the, the lowest energy orbitals first, and then we go to higher energy orbitals. We can put two electrons in each orbital. Electrons sharing an orbital have to have opposite spins represented by an up arrow and a down arrow. And electrons will fill up equal energy orbitals first in the case of p orbitals. So we haven't gotten there yet, but this is the third rule that we'll use. Uh, and we'll do one electron in each orbital spin up before we pair the electrons. Uh, and so let's look at an example of that. So nitrogen has seven electrons. So nitrogen is right here, element seven. It has seven, valent, uh, seven electrons total. And so again, we, we follow the rules here, filling this from lowest energy, uh, lo lowest energy orbital to higher. We put the first electron in the lowest energy 1s orbital. The second goes in the same orbital, orbital but with the opposite spin. Then the next higher en energy orbital is the 2s. So we put the next electron in the 2s with an up spin, and then we put a second electron with a down spin. That's four electrons, but nitrogen has seven, so there's three more. One will. And this is where we're going to apply the third rule. One electron will go in the first orbital, but these orbitals are all the same energy. So electrons would prefer not to share if, if there's another orbital with the same energy. And so the electron, next electron goes here. That's the sixth one. And the seventh one goes here. And now we have all seven electrons here. And uh, we can see that these did not pair up. And the analogy I, I like to, to uh, use is that this is a house right here. We, ha we have a house, and these are all the siblings in the house. So, and these, imagine these are like a bunch of stairs. So these, this is a very tall house. It's hard to get to the next floor. Uh, well, if there's two bedrooms on the first floor, the two kids will probably take those bedrooms because they don't want to walk up like, let's say there's 20 steps here to get to the second floor. The second, it's really, really high. 
But then the next two kids will take this this bedroom, but they don't want to walk up to this floor, which is way higher. But then when the remaining three kids get to this floor, well, they can each have their own room. So they're not going to pair up if they don't have to. Uh, they'd prefer to stay apart. Remember, electrons are all negative too, so they repel each other. So that they, they prefer to be in separate rooms here, separate orbitals, if those are all the same energy. But if it's a lot less energy to go to the lower floor, they'll just go there instead of having their own room because it's too much work to, to walk all the way up there. Uh, and so that, that's what happens here. When oxygen, oxygen has eight electrons, so it has one more than nitrogen. So let's review how that goes again. The first two are gonna go in the lowest energy orbital. We got eight total, so that's the first two. Then the next two are gonna go in the 2s, like that, that's four. Then we'll do one in this orbital, one in this orbital, and one in this orbital. That's seven. But the eighth electron has to pair up. So we put it here with a down spin. And now we have total eight, eight electrons. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And so that's how you draw a energy diagram. Now, this is not a very convenient way of representing the electrons a lot of the times. So often we want a shorter way. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that in a moment. Um, so notice here the shells and, and, and where these electrons went. So the first shell, as you might've noticed, only had an S orbital. And the first shell could only fit two electrons. Okay. Uh, that's, that's, where, that's where they had to go. The second shell had an s orbital and a set of three p orbitals. So this is why the first shell can only fit two electrons. It only has one orbital to fit them in. The second shell has the s orbital, then it has three p orbitals. So that's why it can fit eight total electrons. The third shell also has an s orbital and a set of three p orbitals. It can fit eight electrons and it can fit even more because the third shell has d orbitals but I'm not gonna go into d orbitals. As high am I, uh, 3p is as high as I'm gonna go in this class. You can talk about d orbitals if you take your uh, general chemistry, they'll definitely tell you about that. But since uh, this is just the first intro chemistry class, I only go up to 3p here. So lithium here has, uh, as we saw, three electrons. Um, now, let's go back to lithium. Uh, we're going to go back to lithium, nitrogen, and oxygen here. And we want to describe what we have in this diagram, but we want to describe it in a way that's shorter. So the way that is shorter that we can do this instead is with an electron configuration. And the electron configuration just has you list out the energy level, the orbital, and then how many electrons are in that type of orbital. So there are two here. So the electron configuration for lithium would be 1s2, and then we follow it up with the next electron, which is the, in the 2s orbital, and there's one. So this is the electron configuration for lithium, 1s2, 2s1. This is a much more convenient way of writing these types of things. Now what about nitrogen? So for nitrogen, we can write the electron configuration like this. 1s, and there are two in the 1s. And then in the 2s, right here, 2s orbital, there are two electrons. And in the 2p orbital, there are three electrons. So we're going to write 2p3. And so that's the electron configuration for nitrogen. For oxygen, it would be 1s2, 1s2, 2s2, 2s2, 2 in the 2s. 
And then at 2p, there are four electrons. So we would say 2p4. And in terms of valence electrons, let's review valence electrons. Remember, valence electrons are the electrons in the highest energy orbital. So here, the valence electrons for lithium are right here. They're the electrons in the energy level two. One valence electron for lithium. In nitrogen, the highest energy level is also two. So the valence electrons are all of the electrons in the second energy level. There are five valence electrons in nitrogen. Let's see what group nitrogen is in. If we're counting, now I'm going to count groups this way, the way we do it in the A's. So I'm going to call this one group one, this one group two, then I'm going to call this group three, and that's the way I'm going to call them, and most chemistry teachers do. This grouping up here, one through 18, this is a newer grouping that most chemistry teachers actually don't like because it makes it harder to teach. So we follow the A's here. This is going to be group four. This is going to be group five. And nitrogen is in group five. And it also has five valence electrons. Hmm. A lot of interesting things going on with these, this periodic table and these electron configurations and valence electrons. For oxygen, its highest energy level is the second energy level, which includes the S orbital and these two Ps. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, six valence electrons. I bet you can't guess what group oxygen is in. Oxygen is in group 6A, group 6, oxygen six valence electrons. Again, our group number with these A groups is going to be the number of valence electrons. The row is going to be what energy level those electrons are in. For oxygen, those electrons are in the second energy level. The S and the P orbitals in the second energy level. Now, I told you that you would not have to memorize this, right? As long as you have a periodic table, you do not need to memorize this, okay? Here's what you do to avoid memorizing this. So, I need to draw. can't draw so I'm gonna point it out okay so let's say we want to get the electron configuration now now we're gonna to try to get the electron configuration for let's say <clears throat> sulfur okay I'm gonna do this for sulfur we want the electron configuration here's how we can do this using the periodic table. We start at the top of the periodic table, right here. And we, we're going to read this periodic table from the top to bottom, left to right. This area right here, groups one and two, these are going to indicate the filling of the S orbitals. We call this the S block. This area right here on the periodic table, this is going to represent the filling of p orbitals. We call this the p block. And for this purpose, it's useful to kind of put helium right here. It kind of belongs here. The first row is special because the first energy level only has s orbitals. So hydrogen kind of belongs here uh, for, some re for some applications, and helium kind of belongs here. Uh, for this, for this it, it's useful to picture helium being right here. So, so since we're in the first orbital, 
we're going to write, or the first row, we're going to write 1. And since we're in the S area right here, we're going to write S. S. Then we're going to count our way across, and we're going to pretend helium's right here. 1, 2. It's 2 across. And the S area is 2 across because an S set of S orbital, it's only one S orbital, it can only fit two electrons. That's why this first area here is only two across. Now this shape is starting to make sense, right? So we're going to count it across. We count two, so we write two. Next, we're done with the first row. The first row is only two across. So now we're in the second row. So we're going to write two. Two. And then we're going to write S, since we're in this area. This area right here is the S area. So we're going to write S. Then we're going to count our way across the S area. One for lithium, two for beryllium. So two spaces, two. Now notice the second row has more over here in the p orbital because the second energy level has a p orbital. So it has elements here in the p block which represent electrons going into p orbitals and so now we're going to write two because we're still in the second row right here we're still in the second row but we're in the p area so we're going to write two p and then we're going to count our way across one two three four five six six across so we write two p six because there's three p orbitals, two electrons can fit in each one, six total. Now we're at the end of the second row where neon is. So we're gonna drop down to the third row and we'll write three, three. And we're gonna continue until we get to sulfur. We're not there yet, sulfur's right here. We're in the S area, so this area is the S area right here. And we're in the third row, so we write three S. And then we count our way across. One, two, two spaces. We write two. Then next we read across here. Still in the third row, but now we're in the P area. So we're going to write 3P. And then we count across to sulfur. One, two, three, Four. It's the fourth one in. Four electrons in the p orbital. And that's the way you do it. Notice this works for oxygen and nitrogen that we got by using that big ugly or orbital diagram here. So uh, this one was the one here. This one was for nitrogen. This one was for nitrogen here. This one for oxygen. Let's try it with, with oxygen. So for oxygen, we say 1, right here, 1s, helium's right here, 1, 2. 1s, 2. Then we go 2, we're in the second row because we finished the first row. We're in the s area right here, and it's 2 across, so we say 2s, 2. Then we move across second row. We're still in the second row, so we write 2 right here by the p. But we're in the P block, so we write P, not S, and then we count our way in. One, two, three, four. So we write a four right there. And so you don't have to write this whole big, long uh, energy diagram like we did here. You don't have to write this out if you aren't asked. If you just need the electron configuration, you can use the periodic table like we did just there. And that's why the periodic table is shaped in the way it is. It's shaped in this way to represent where the electrons are going, what energy levels and what orbitals here. The row representing the, eight, the energy level, this here representing putting electrons into s orbitals, this one putting electrons into uh, p orbitals. Except helium kind of belongs here because its electron will be in the s orbital. So uh, that is electron configurations. That's how you write them. 
again, uh, going back to the periodic table here, I am not going to do any electron configurations past 3p. So 3p is represented by this area right here. I will not do electron configuration questions on anything larger than argon. So you don't have to worry about d orbitals on my exams or quizzes. So as we saw, the periodic table is grouping elements according to their number of valence electrons in their highest energy shell. Uh, so we, d we saw we could divide the table into blocks where the same types of orbitals are filling, s orbitals, p orbitals. And we can use that to determine the electron configuration. Uh, when we or Ultimately, we're going to use this information to decide how atoms bond. We don't need anything fancy. We just need a periodic table. Uh, the group number is the number of valence electrons. This is going to be really important as we move forward. So group one is going to be one valence electron. Group two, two valence electrons. That's this group right here, starting with beryllium. Whoops. Uh, group three here, these will have three valence electrons. Group four, these will have four valence electrons. Group five, these will have five. Group six, these will have six. Group seven, these have seven. Group eight, these all have eight. And so that's going to be really important for the future is knowing that the group number tells us the number of valence electrons. And that is why elements in the same column have similar chemical properties and behave very similarly. It's because the chemical properties are going to be decided based on the number of valence electrons. So finally, uh, as we study the periodic table here, we also want to talk about one last topic, which is in the last section of the chapter 8 here in your textbook. It is periodic trends. And we're going to talk about two periodic trends in particular. One is the ionization energy, or IE. And this is the energy that would be required to remove an electron completely from an atom, which is going to be very important. In some chemical reactions, some atoms are going to be losing electrons and some are going to be gaining electrons and so uh, um, related to how this will happen will be what is the energy required to take off an electron from an atom that's losing electrons uh, what's going to be key here is the strength with which uh, the the different types of atoms pull on their electrons what's really important is that at the top right here Right here, this is going to be where atoms pull most strongly on electrons. In particular, fluorine pulls the strongest on electrons. We're going to, not going to talk a lot about the pull for these guys right here. These are the noble gases. And the reason why we're not going to talk much about the noble gases is because for reasons we'll discuss later, they don't tend to bond with other atoms or stick to other atoms. But fluorine definitely does, and the atoms up at the top right of the periodic table pull on electrons the hardest, uh, they, and they are, the electrons are most attracted to the middle of the atom, the nucleus. On the other end, where francium is, these have the weakest pull on their electrons. Let's think about why this is. So the easiest way to remember these is to is to Think about why this is true, why it's true that we have the strongest electron pulling atoms at the top right of the periodic table and the weakest electron pulling atoms on the bottom left. So let's think about what happens to the pull on electrons of elements as we move from left to right across the periodic table. Well, if we're moving left to right across the periodic table, we're getting more and more protons in the nucleus. Lithium has three protons, beryllium has four protons, boron has five, carbon has six, uh, nitrogen has uh, seven, or, sorry, nitrogen has five, sorry, nitrogen has seven protons, oxygen has eight, fluorine has nine, neon has ten. Basically, as we go left to right, we have more and more protons. And so we're getting more and more, as we go left to right in the periodic table, here we have a little bitty positive. But here, as we get more and more to the right, we have a bigger, bigger positive. And so for the electrons that are traveling around, 
the attraction on the left side is weaker than it is on the right side because these are all going to be in the same energy level. So they're all going to be around the same distance from the nucleus. However, there is a lot more protons in a fluorine atom than there is compared to a lithium atom. And so, and that's going to be true every time as we go left to right across the periodic table. So left to right, we're getting stronger and stronger pulls on the electrons because we have more and more protons in atoms as we go left to right. But the electrons aren't any farther away from the nucleus. However, as we go from top to bottom, the electrons are going in higher and higher energy levels, meaning they're farther and farther away from the nucleus, which means that the attraction between the electrons and the nucleus is getting weaker and weaker. And so that's why as we go top to bottom here, the, elect the pull on the electrons is smaller and smaller. It's because in francium, uh, we'll have a little you know, nucleus here, and the electrons will be way out here, way out there. This wasn't very circular, but they're so far so the pull on them isn't very hard. You can think of this like, again, like satellites around the Earth or something around the Earth. If you're up in space, you're, you're oh man, I, I drew behind myself. Oh, dang it, sorry guys. I need to pay attention to that. So basically, what I was saying is that we get more and more protons as we go left and right on the periodic table. But the electrons aren't any farther away. And so the attraction gets stronger and stronger as you move left to right. Sorry, I drew behind myself. I wasn't paying attention to that. But for francium here, its electrons are in group seven. So the electrons are super far away from the nucleus. So again, you can think of this like as, as you know, an astronaut gets farther from Earth, the pull of the Earth on the astronaut is smaller and smaller. That's like true for these electrons. For francium, it's like its electron is way out in space. Its nucleus can barely pull on its electrons. Uh, however, for fluorine, the electrons are very close and it has a lot more protons. Let's say this is lithium here and this is fluorine. It has a lot more protons than, than lithium, so it has a much stronger positive charge and a much stronger pull on these electrons. So the pull gets higher and higher as you go left to right and get smaller and smaller as you go top to bottom. So we get the strongest pull up at the top right of the periodic table and the weakest pull at the bottom left. And so ionization energy is basically a measurement of how strongly that, that nucleus is holding on to its electrons. For, uh, for fluorine, it's extra, extra hard to pull off an electron because it's pulling on its electrons so hard. Whereas for francium, it's, it's pretty easy to pull off the electron because it's barely holding on to it at all. Its electron is like way up in outer space. It's barely pulled on onto that, that nucleus at all. Now, the other periodic trend we're going to talk about goes opposite to this. It's atomic radius. And so again, for atomic radius here, we have the same, the same, uh, uh, the same type of pulling pattern. We have the strongest pull up at the top right of the periodic table where fluorine is, and the weakest pull down at the bottom left where cesium and, and uh, francium are. So the result is that at the top, you have small atoms, not a lot of stuff in them, and the, those are, they're pulling on their electrons very hard. So for fluorine, it's got this big strong pull. The electron is not very far away. So its electron is pulled in real tight and you end up with a very small radius. It's 67 uh, picometers actually, very, very small. Pico is 10 to the minus 12 meters. Whereas with cesium, this is a huge atom, tons of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And its electrons are way far away from the nucleus. So in, in cesium, the electrons are, are like way out here, they're way out here, and it's really big. And the electron, the pull towards the middle is, is quite weak, it's little. And so those electrons swing around wide and make a very, very big, uh, big radius. And so um, to summarize here, ionization energy is strongest at the top left of the periodic table, it's biggest and smallest at the bottom left. This are strongest at the top right, smallest at the bottom left. It's because ionization energy gets bigger 
the stronger the electrons are being pulled and it gets smaller the weaker the electrons are pulled atomic radius goes opposite it's small where there are few protons and neutrons and where the electrons are being pulled in really really tight it atomic radius is biggest where there is lots of protons neutrons and electrons in the atom so the lots of space is taking up and also the electrons are being pulled very weakly so they swing around real, real wide and make a really big radius and so that uh, concludes the lecture about um, the the electron configurations and what the electrons do around an atom and also the implications as, as they relate to the uh, periodic trends of ionization energy and atomic radius. Uh, so go ahead and make sure you read chapter 8 and complete the homework. Our experiment this week is experiment 2. It's about measurement, so it's a very good review of what we talked about in week 2. And that's going to really help you as you prepare to get ready for the exam next week. Also, we have a discussion. The discussion is about YouTube channels that may uh, be a good source of additional videos and help for you guys. Uh, I am not the best video creator yet. I'm still kind of working on it, but uh, I recommended to you a lot of really cool YouTubers that you can check out that may give you videos that you like uh, just to add and help you to review as you're getting ready for the exam. Uh, so hopefully you'll find one that you like and your assignment in the discussion is to tell the other students in the class about why you like this particular YouTuber and their chemistry videos. Uh, so I, I hope you have a good week studying and, and finishing off the exam one material and next week will be about exam one review and uh, I will see you guys later.